Merci, cher Bertrand. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and, and for the invitation. I'm very happy about our partnership with Project Syndicate, which will emerge from this event today. Uh, it's great uh, to be here to see the platform Sustainability Now launched. It will bring together a wide range of top experts for an interdisciplinary discussion on how to build a sustainable global economy. I'm here in New York uh, this time again for the General Assembly of the United Nations, like so many times in the last decades. Four years ago, we were celebrating the political success of achieving agreement on the Sustainable Development Goals. Four months later, we convened in Paris and finally got an agreement on the Paris uh, objectives for climate. Then we have been going through four years and uh, we didn't look too closely at it. Now that we uh, take stock, we find out that, well, one can say we are on the right track, but we are definitely far behind schedule. So it's time to push the, the thing forward and uh, get some more momentum into it. And I think the moment has never been better than now. Eminent economists, scientists, bankers, policymakers, business and civil society leaders will push, publish on this platform. And their commentary will be distributed to newspaper readers all over the world. This is more than welcome because we need a well-informed global dialogue to solve our most urgent global problem. We must support the voices of reason against the rising tide of populism. When we lose the support of citizens, we cannot prevail in the fight against climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to speak at this conference. It brings together many organizations with, we partner with and fosters the spirit of cooperation between multilateral institutions academia and the private sector, a spirit that is so much needed today. Humanity is at a crossroads. During my 30 years in public life, I have seen world-changing events very closely. The fall of the Berlin Wall was very close to me. 9-11 was very close to me. The financial crisis came very close to me. It feels to me like we are going through another one of these seismic shifts. And millions of young people around the world are protesting against political and business leaders that are too slow to react to the climate challenge. Their protests have started to change majorities in our democratic institutions, as we have seen this spring in the European Parliament elections. The development of the first semester of 2019 in Europe hit like thunder and lightning and we will not return to the time before. All democratic institutions are now reacting, and we have heard that yesterday at the UN Climate Action Summit, and it is all about time. The Paris Agreement has set us on the right track, but we are moving too slowly. We must act immediately and swiftly if we want to ensure a sustainable transition to a net zero emissions economy. If we wait too long, we risk having to enact an abrupt transition, which would also be disruptive for the financial markets. Or worse, we may be unable to transition altogether and face existential consequences for the human race and many forms of life on our planet. The IPCC clearly indicated that years to 2030 are our lowest, as our lowest window of opportunity to avert catastrophic climate change. And this is also true for the protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. So investments over the next two to 15 years will change the face of our economies and our societies. So to quote Nobel Prize laureate Paul Romer, in the next 10 years, we will build the cities where humanity will live forever, a crucial challenge for rapidly urbanizing developing nations. This is why I was glad yesterday to present at the General Assembly Lucy a leadership for urban climate investment that will strengthen the capacity of 2,000 cities over the next six years to prepare projects and link 1,000 new projects to finance. In Europe and other industrialized countries, we'll, we'll need to replace the majority of our infrastructure stock within a generation. Scientists have clearly shown us the consequences of making the wrong investment decisions and remaining on an unsustainable path. By the way, from a banker's point of view, it's a pretty unpleasant idea to think that one day we might sit on 
stranded assets. For the financial community, this situation represents an unprecedented opportunity to play a major role in making our economies carbon neutral, greener, climate resilient, as well as more inclusive. That means maintaining our society's stability. Yet, we also face a major challenge to recognize the right investments and massively redirect capital towards them. The reality is that sustainable finance flows fall well short of the trillions of dollars that, we need, to be, that need to be invested in low-carbon and climate-resilient assets. And the pipeline of high-quality projects reaching the market is insufficient. Something is amiss, ladies and gentlemen. Public finance institutions like the EU Bank must play a leading role to facilitate the flow of private capital into sustainable investments at the needed scale globally by helping to create the right environment and partnering with the private sector. When we talk about achieving the sustainable development goals, or for that matter, the Paris objectives, forget to finance that with taxpayers' money only, or even predominantly. We need to have a better cooperation and the use of the same language between the public sector and the private sector financial institutions. I believe that since it's a public objective, public finance institutions should feel the responsibility to lead. If you want to win a race with time like this, it's not sufficient to do just enough to reach the finishing line. You have to cross the finishing line at full speed to win. And this is how we need to look at the years until 2030. Each one of our institutions and each one of us as citizens can choose to be a part of the solution or bear the responsibility of continued inaction. So young people are vigorously reminding us of this and we must listen. We at the EIB group have been listening. We have been at the forefront of the fight against climate emergency in line with the European Union's leading role. Our experience gives us the confidence that we can do even more. We, can, we know we can set ourselves increasingly ambitious goals and deliver on them. Since 2012, we have provided 150 billion euros of finance, supporting 550 billion euros, so over 600 billion dollar of investment in climate action and environmental sustainability. And that made us the world's largest multilateral provider of finance for projects supporting these objectives. In 2015, in Paris, we pledged to provide 100 billion US dollars for climate action projects in the five years until 2020, and we are delivering. The EU member states rely on us. The President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, said yesterday at the UN that the European Council expects the EIB to increase its ambition to deliver on climate action and environmental sustainability within the EU, but also in supporting the EU's climate objectives globally. And the new president-elect of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, expressed in her speech in the European Parliament the expectation that the European Investment Bank is the EU climate bank and raises its activities to 50% of the overall business in this context. We have reacted to that. We stand ready to embark on a new journey as we finalize the EIB's increased ambition for 2030 which builds around three commitments. Firstly, we will increase our own financing. Last year, nearly 30% of our commitments worldwide were dedicated to such goals. I, I want us to be much bolder and aim for 50% for climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025. Secondly, we commit to making a real difference in growing sustainable finance from billions to trillions. By working with our public and private partners, we aim to help unlock more than $1.1 trillion of investment for climate change projects by 2030. This will include a market increase in support for climate adaptation and resilience. Thirdly, we aim to align all our direct lending activities with the principles and goals of the Paris Agreement, because it does not make sense if you do 50% of your lending climate, climate project related, and with the other 50%, you undermine the climate objectives. As an important first step, we will therefore phase out energy projects that depend solely on fossil fuels. 
This builds on our 2015 climate strategy, which committed us to mainstream climate change consideration in everything we do. Science tells us that transitioning to carbon neutral economy entails ending the use of fossil fuel as soon as possible. We are used to thinking in terms of emission standards for decades. So we have therefore, due to our emission performance standards, not supported any coal-fired power projects for the almost a decade, the first MDB to do so. We will position the EIB as an incubator for climate finance and expertise to mobilize others, helping our societies and economies transform to a low carbon future. But of course, I'm aware, I'm sitting in the European Council sometimes and in the Finance Minister's Council always. We must not forget that some countries are further advanced than others on the road to a low carbon economy and that some areas, communities and sectors will be much more deeply affected than others by this transition. So we must sure that no one is left behind in our fight against climate change. We therefore commit to increase our support for a just and fair transition of the most vulnerable regions and groups. And this is not about finding alt alt alternatives to fossil fuels as provider of energy. It's also about jobs and stability of societies. Currently, 41 regions in the European Union are mining coal, providing jobs to about 200, 250,000 people, most of whom have limited opportunities to find alternative employment. You simply don't move from a coal mine down in, in the in the, the mountain uh, to a uh, startup on digital economy. That takes a little bit of time, so and it takes a little bit of support. And we believe it takes a lot of support we must provide. In 2016, the EU pledged to support coal and carbon intensive regions in their shift to a new model, working with all relevant partners. We are committed to supporting this effort. For instance, we are proposing a dedicated energy transition package in our new energy lending policy. We have been supporting, supporting this just transition for a long time. One example is our work with the Polish municipality of Katowice over the past 20 years. Most of, them, most of you know Katowice because we had a COP there recently. Our 205 million euro loans contributed to the successful transition from stagnating coal mining town to a vibrating urban center, offering new business opportunities and a healthy environment for the citizens. Projects like these are needed to ensure broad support for a transition that is inevitable. Protest waves like the Yellow Vest movement, Gilets Jaunes en France, have shown that the best climate action strategy does not help when you lose the support of your citizens. The financial markets have a major role to play in this whole transition. Investor attitude has started to change. And my conversations this week in New York show me that the appetite for green investment has grown considerably. This quantum leap that I have observed on the political side in Europe this first semester is replicated in the private sector and in many financial institutions of the private sector. The market for green and sustainable bonds has broken the $800 billion threshold. That's great. However, this pro Progress pales when compared with the scale of the global bond market of around 100 trillion US dollars. Saying that there is room for improvement is a clear understatement. But still, the 800 billion are a big success. Because when we introduced the first green bonds in, 19, in, in 2007 at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, our predecessors at that time were considered lunatics. And soon after, that market really exploded and was a huge success. As a public finance institution, EIB Group can play a key role by acting as a market maker and help to direct private finance towards sustainable investments, particularly when it comes to capital markets instruments. As the pioneers of the green bond market, we understand well the potential value of this investment. We issued the first bond already in 2007, have issued around 26 billion euros since, in 13 currencies. And in 2018, we also issued one of the first SDG bonds, or sustainability awareness bonds, for which we made a new, very successful issuance last week of 250 million in a small market that was Sweden, Swedish krona. 
Our sustainability awareness bonds extend our ability to use proceeds to support other sustainability objectives, starting here with water, health, and education sectors, and that's only the beginning. But let me quite clear as well, the success of the green bonds and the sustainability, sustainability awareness bonds will depend upon our ability pro to produce security for the investors. The investors don't accept that you ha don't have clear principles, rules, and a taxonomy. You don't take a piece of paper, paint it green, and say this is a green bond. The investor needs to know, he, he or she must know, what we do with that money. So accountability, traceability, sustainability, and personal accountability are key for the success of this thing. That was difficult enough for the green bonds, but I'm just imagining how difficult it will be to arrive at such a taxonomy for sustainability awareness bonds in weird dimensions uh, that we do not talk about very often. So it is a hell of a challenge, but it must be met and it can be done. To conclude, I repeat, repeat that there is an, an extremely urgent need for more ambitious action. We have just over 10 years to turn the tide of the climate and environmental emergency. I would like to make you all an offer. EIB is already a global climate bank and the EU climate bank and a global green bank. Yet we are now committed to doing much more. The EIB group and other financial institutions have a clear role to pay to play in paving the way for other investors to rise to the challenge and seize the opportunity. We cannot overcome this crisis alone. We need to join forces. We need to work in partnership. We are here to work with all of you to take this agenda forward. So let us build a strong coalition for urgent action. And let us use this coalition so that the next generation will remember the moment we started reversing the crisis and addressing the greatest of challenge faced by the global community. Thank you very much.